Something I'd like to emphasize about the planet Isla is that it can often be understood through the lens of duality. This is perhaps most apparent from space, where the tidal locking of this world is easily observed. From this vantage point, Isla's opposing substellar and antistellar hemispheres can be viewed together, with the former being the easiest visible as it is constantly bathed in light. These two halves of the planet couldn't be more different from one another. However, it's their dichotomy which creates the conditions governing life on the surface. The relationship between light and dark is a defining characteristic of Isla. And while it is best illustrated on this large planetary scale, it is also readily observable on the surface. Here, entire environments are defined by the duality of light and dark. Any object on the surface, be it organic or inorganic, creates opposing conditions on its north and south facing sides. Protruding features like this rock capture the unmoving light of Isla's star, but in turn must also cast a shadow. In the last episode of this series, I introduced a pair of terms which we can use to describe these two resulting sub-environments. Umbric describes areas which are constantly bathed in darkness. Its counterpart, the term photic, refers to those which are constantly exposed to light. Photic and umbric zones are, by their very nature, always found together, often with a delicate network of life connecting them. Now, to clarify, light exposure on this planet is not limited to a perfect binary. Just as the endless sunsets of the Terminator region exist between hemispheres of day and night, so too are there sub-environments which fall somewhere between umbric and photic conditions. Beneath the canopy of the lush plains, direct light exposure is rare, but nonetheless, there are enough ambient wavelengths to sustain specialized phototrophic life. Likewise, features like clouds or sandstorms can plunge an otherwise well-lit region into shadow, turning a photic environment, at least temporarily, into an umbric one. Lighting on this world and the duality that comes with it has been a major theme of the last few installments of this show. While these ideas will continue to be relevant, for these next episodes, I'd like to pivot our focus to Isla's other defining environmental feature, the wind. Just as features of the landscape break up the exposure to light, they do the same for the near-constant airflow characteristic of this world. As objects extend into the atmosphere, their obstruction of the wind creates yet another duality of environmental conditions. In this short episode of the series, let's continue to explore how rugosity on Isla's surface adds variability to its environments and how new niches are created when the near constant wind of this world is redirected by the landscape. This is the Isla Project. So recently, a patron of the show reached out to commission a custom print from the project, one inspired by NASA's popular space tourism posters. This is the resulting image, and it's been made available for print over on my website. I'm really happy with how this poster turned out, and it's also special because it's the first time I've ever depicted people in an environment of Isla. This isn't something I plan on doing often, since my goals with the project don't really concern any narrative of human exploration. Anyway, if you'd like to hang it on your wall, go check out oliverbutdigital.com. And if you'd like to further support the show, please consider becoming a patron as well. As one could imagine, volcanism on this world is responsible for all kinds of hazardous conditions. Flows of molten rock and eruptions of toxic gas are common, but there is another product of geothermal activity to watch for if one is traversing the surface of Isla. This is what is known as a pyroclast, or a fragment of volcanic debris which has been jettisoned into the sky. Specifically, this is magma, which rapidly cooled as it was propelled into the upper atmosphere. 
When pyroclasts enter the right air current, they can be carried for hundreds of kilometers by the planet's violent winds. While they can fly for extended periods of time, at one point or another, heavier pieces must eventually make landfall. We find ourselves in an oasis of sorts, formed around a ventifact, or a natural feature sculpted by wind-driven sand and other debris like the pyroclast which brought us here. On many areas of the planet, wind can swirl in a variety of directions. However, there are some locations, like this oasis here, where its trajectory is largely unchanging. Gusts passing across this oasis collide with the vent effect, creating areas of high and low pressure on its opposing sides. These contrasting areas can be considered sub-environments of their own, so let's introduce a few more terms which will be useful for describing them. The southern facing side of this rock can be classified as windward, as it experiences the full forces of the gale. The opposite side of the feature is leeward, or in a sheltered position downwind of the air current. Any protruding object on Isla will feature these two opposing zones. However, it's the largest formations, cliffs, mountains, valleys, and ravines, where windward and leeward regions have the biggest impact on surface organisms. Each features contrasting atmospheric conditions, and we often see different fauna showing behavioral preference for one side or another. Today, however, I'd like to begin by discussing the more sessile inhabitants of this world. So let's take a closer look at the niche partitioning that takes place here for various autotrophic organisms. The northern side of this ventifact, as is often the case for leeward regions, is also a photic zone. As a result, the most dominant life we observe here uses light as a source of energy. The tall flora growing up from the sand are various species of sphenophyte, or spire tree, a major clade of phototroph defined by their slim, vertical forms. Those growing here are largely sheltered from the wind, and thus have the opportunity to take on all kinds of strange shapes. When it comes to classifying spire trees, there are six prominent families, each identifiable by their respective body forms. These can be further categorized into one of two broader clades. The strictids are adapted to growing in unsheltered, windswept environments where aerodynamic body forms are prioritized. Tenaxid spire trees, on the other hand, are found in locations where airflow is less of a concern, and thus they grow to maximize surface area instead. Tenaxids also generally break away from the rigid, symmetrical body plans of stricted spire trees. These two clades can be described as polyphyletic, meaning that they are not defined by strict taxonomic relationship but rather by shared features and ecological niches. A cladogram of these various taxa illustrates this point for us. Despite being more closely related to certain families of stricted spire trees, fluctomorph species are better categorized as tenaxids thanks to their asymmetrical body plans. Wind is largely obstructed here on the northern side of the oasis so we primarily see Tenaxid spire trees being selected for on this little island of sand. Accompanying this photosynthetic growth are clusters of wispy kinets growing from the sand. The leeward side of this oasis features lower pressure, turbulent air, which is gentler and doesn't require kinets to grow particularly large or rigid. These are what we would call tenuid kinets. Species of this classification are small, thin, and often lack any pronounced kite organ. Instead, they rely on the natural turbulence of the wind to induce the oscillating motion they use to produce energy. Tenuid kinets are often fragile, 
and most importantly for this discussion, they are usually found growing in leeward sub-environments, where Isla's winds are at least partially obstructed. Their counterparts, kynets growing on the windward side of this formation, are unshielded from the gale, but also have more access to energy. These kynets grow larger and better armored, since they are exposed to the flying sand and debris being carried through the atmosphere. A number of the kynets here can be seen growing in opposition to the wind, before curving back around and setting their kites adrift in the air current. These would be described as recursive kynets, a variety which we generally see inhabiting areas of intense wind exposure. Once again, this is a classification determined by morphology, rather than any shared genetic lineage. Kynets with recursive forms can be found all across the planet, and often exhibit the most exaggerated swaying motion as they harvest the kinetic energy of Isla's winds. We will be diving deeper into Kynida synthetic life soon, I promise. For now though, I'll simply encourage you to observe how morphologies differ depending on where a kynet is growing and what wind exposure is like in that area. This side of the rock is also harboring faunal life. A pair of Zygoscapus giganteum have stopped to rest here, looking to cool themselves in the shadowed pool of water. While these migrating species are adapted to withstanding intense heat and radiation, umbric zones are always a welcome respite from the unrelenting energy of Isla's star. Diundecapod mothers generally produce an even number of young, so it's likely that this large female has lost some offspring on the journey here. Zygoscapus giganteum halt their reproductive cycles as they traverse desolate environments like this. So with a juvenile male accompanying her, we can deduce that they departed fertile grounds not too long ago. These two are using specialized antenna organs on their back to smell the air passing overhead. These appendages are used by many older clades of diodecapods for a range of purposes, but principally for olfaction. Perhaps the most stereotypical morphology of these antenna is found in Dercostrids, where a pair of tendrils protrude laterally from both sides of the abdomen. While these appendages appear separate, a look internally reveals that they are in fact both a part of the same bifurcated or branching organ. When observing distant relatives like Zygoscapus giganteum, we can see how this feature has changed over the course of evolution. In order to catch odorants higher in the air current, this organ emerges dorsally, with the bifurcation appearing external to the body. Using their large antenna, this species can sample the atmosphere for even the faintest of scents. We've caught the oasis here in a time of relative abundance, but it is nonetheless limited in what it can offer. The shallow pool of water will evaporate quickly, no doubt before the next rainstorm passes through to refill it. As the water vanishes, so too will its cooling effect on the area. When the day comes that this reservoir runs dry, many of the plants will start to wither, and even some of the kynets will die of thirst. Visiting faunal species will move on in search of nourishment elsewhere. The oasis will grow dormant, waiting for the next monsoon to come and revitalize it once again. This ventifact is not a feature unique to the Badlands. Formations like this can be found all across the planet, and we often see small ecosystems developing around them. On a world where much of the surface is sculpted smooth, small islands of rugosity break up the landscape and create opposing sub-environments within which life can diversify. With increased vertical complexity, dueling photic and umbric zones encourage the growth of differing autotrophic organisms. Likewise, leeward and windward regions also offer contrasting atmospheric conditions with which species can contend. 
The exposure to wind or lack thereof can dictate not only the morphologies of creatures, but also their behaviors. It is this last point which we will be discussing in the next episode of this series, as we return to the lush plains to observe the hunting behavior of some familiar organisms. Thank you for watching this episode of The Isla Project. As always, if you're interested in supporting the show, please consider joining the Patreon, where you can get behind-the-scenes access to its production. And of course, a huge thank you to everyone who is already a member. Until next time.